Hi, my name is Sharon Funderburg, and I'm coming to you from Franklin Boulevard Media. I grew up right here in Gastonia, born and raised, been here a majority of my life. I left for a little bit uh, in my teens, like from 13 to 16, I spent some time in D.C., and but for the most of it, I've been here most of my life. I grew up... Uh, Hmm. On the Victory, the neighborhood was called the Victory, and then we had Mountain View on one side, we had Firestone on one side, um, and then the other side of the track, so to speak, was on the other side. Um, but I grew up in that neighborhood, and a lot of my story happened there. Um, the rape, the molestation, um, a lot of the neighborhood abuse happened in that area. But um, for the most of it, my mom was a single parent. You know, she had different boyfriends, but for the most of it, she raised us as a single parent. I have one sister who's older. She's deceased. She's been deceased 15 years. My mom just passed away January this year. So um, I feel like I'm a loner now, and I'm out here in this world all by myself. But um, I had two straight women, two great women, two straight great women who helped impart a lot of wisdom in me and so uh, for a long time in 2022 I didn't think I was going to make it because the two women that were my backbone died the same week. The lady that helped me get clean and get my life together she passed away on that Monday and my mom passed away that Friday of January um, the first week in January and um I think that had it not been for for my husband praying for me and I, I would not have made it. Um, he has been uh, the backbone of who I am in the, for the last 20 years and he has been a large part of the inspiration that helped me follow my dream and start my nonprofit. Okay, so I grew up in the neighborhood. It was called the Victory. Again, like I said, um, uh, the whole neighborhood was dysfunctional. It was a dysfunctional neighborhood. A lot of working class people, but a lot of, in the area that I grew up, there were a lot of drinking and drugging. Uh, back then, they was called liquor houses. Then later on, they became bootleggers. But it was a lot of that happening in the community. So um, a lot of the kids that I grew up with and a lot of the kids that I grew up around come from those same kind of impoverished communities. My mom was a single parent. There was a lot of single parents going on around us. My mom worked really hard. She, um, she worked um, to take care of us. Uh, my stepdad was a large part of my life. My mom dated this, um, my stepdad, and he was like the father figure in my life for a real long time. My biological father was not a large part of my life, but my stepdad was there. Okay, so this is how Knock Off The Streets started. The Off The Streets program came from a large part of what I'm a byproduct of it. So from age 19, yeah, I'm gonna say age 19 to age 31, I got into the drinking and the drugging and then the hard drugs came about in the early 80s. You know, the cocaine, it was powdered then. Then it went over into free basin, like in 85, 86. And I got caught in the grip of that monster and the crack, the crack scene. I've never smoked crack. I, I'm a base head. We, we free base. We made our own. We cooked our own. But I got caught in that trap. And so in between graduating in 81 and going through what I went through from 81 to 94. This dr drinking, drugging, prostitution, jails, prisons, uh, in and out of bad relationships, most of the failed relationships, abusive relationships. Uh, but by the time I was in my tw mid twenties, I became the abuser. Uh, in the relationships. By the time I was 25, I was tired of being beaten and, 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 and mentally or physically abused in a relationship, so I became the abuser. Uh, I became the person that was really aggressive uh, in the relationship. 
if they put their hands on me, I'd get drunk with them, make sure they was drunker than I was. And when they passed out, I'd done stuff to them, set them on fire, throw grease on them, hot grease on them. Um, I done stuff to them. Uh, wasn't survival. It, it was not survival. It was abuse. I'm not twisted about that. I didn't, by the time I was 25, I didn't let men do to me what a lot of people put up with. I was, I would take the first lick. I would, wasn't about survival. It was like, if I had a black, if we got in a fight and I had a black eye, you gonna have one too. If I have to wait till you go to sleep, you get in a black eye or a busted lip, whatever. Uh, I was one of those people who was really, really angry from age 13. When I got raped at age 11, uh, I told one adult about the rape. And when I told this adult, she made it seem like it was my fault. And so when I told her that I had gotten raped and my little, my little girl parts was hurting, and I told her what happened, and she said, you shouldn't be so fast. So that shut me down. And I didn't, tell, I didn't talk to anybody else about that for years. It just, I just balled it up, and I became this great big old ball of anger. So by the time I was 13 years old, I was acting out in school. Um, I was acting out in the community. I was, you know, staying out past curfew. Uh, the neighborhood started calling me midnight because my mom got off at, at, at 11.30, so I was always trying to get home before mom got home, so they started calling me midnight. And that was like the beginning of me acting out. This was before the drugs, so I knew something was wrong because I had all these things going on inside of me and I wasn't like the rest of the little girls. Um, prior to that, you know, from, you know, climbing trees and playing, you know, playing in the dirt and all those things, that stuff went away. Uh, at age 11, when I got gang raped by the four boys in my neighborhood, they, they, I know something happened inside of me. So by the time I was 13 years old, I was just angry and acting out. Um, I started stealing at 13. I remember the first time I got caught stealing in Eckert's, um, I stole a can of Pringles, and the lady that was holding me for, back then they had truant officers. Uh, the lady that was holding me for the truant officer, me and the girl that I was with, can't say her name because she's still doing what she does, um, but my partner in crime, we jumped on the lady. I don't think we beat her up, but I think we just kind of fought her off so we could get away. But we never went back to Eckert's. Uh, but I remember getting caught, and then when we got away, I, I felt like I had had done something, and it was a change inside of me. And it was like that was the beginning of a rush from stealing. So I already knew something was inside of me going on with me. And this is long before the drugs came onto the scene. Um, so I knew I had something wrong with me. Didn't know what it was, but it wasn't until I got into recovery I realized that it was, you know, the disease of addiction. And I know today, and I teach the girls, that this thing is, is wicked. It's, I mean, it's cunning, baffling, wicked, and insidious. And I have to make sure I pay attention to how it wiggles itself out of other little cracks. Uh, if it ain't the drugs, it's gambling. If it ain't gambling, it's stealing. If it ain't, you know, it, it's going to show up, you know, lying, cheating, stealing, cunning, manipulating. It's going to show up. So I have to be real careful about how I do things and what and pay attention. And I teach the girls, you know, you got to see yourself coming. But I started seeing these things early on. I think I started stealing, like, from stores at 13. But I was doing stuff sneaky like from eight years old. I knew uh, back in the day they used to have the machines where you could stick your hand up in there and the row of the snacks. At eight years old at the laundromat on Saturdays, my, my sister and I were made to wash clothes. She was 11 and I was eight. Uh, I could clean out that whole first row by sticking my hand up in the vending machine and, and bringing, cause you know when you take one, it spins the next one to the front and I, and started doing that at eight years old and she and I would split it and I would sell candy or give candy away at school looking for acceptance and trying to make friends. So I knew something was going on with me at an early age, didn't know what. And it 
kind of manifest itself later on in life. And then when drugs came on the set, it was like um, I had found my tribe. I had I had made I had found the people that I belonged to. Cause for a real long time, I didn't know where I belonged. I didn't know where I fitted at. I just was angry and mad all the time, and couldn't really talk to nobody because I grew up in an era what happens in the house stays in the house. You don't tell nobody your business. Uh, and like I said, I shared it with one adult. I never told my mom, but um, in, in 1993, I'm gonna say, um, hmm, it was in 91, I was about to go to prison for the second time. And my mom asked me, like, the week before I was supposed to go to court, um, what's wrong with you? And it was like the answer, I don't know. I don't know. And, you know, she's like, well, and, and I knew going to go, I was facing, I was facing 18 years. I was, I was facing 18 years. Um, but when I got to court, uh, my mom was like, you know, I don't know how to help you. I don't know what to do for you. And I knew that it wasn't nothing she could do because by that time, my, my life was so unmanageable that family members don't understand. All they know is there's something wrong with you and you need help. And I heard that so many times when I was growing up, something wrong with you, you need help. But growing up in this small town, the kind of help I needed wasn't really out there. So when I created Off the Streets program, I wanted to be the help that I looked for all my life. And I do that with these girls. I teach them how to see themselves coming. I, I, I re-raise, retrain, and reprogram them. So in other words, you got to know who you are. You got to learn what makes you tick. You got to learn what makes you who you are. And, and what the first thing I learned about who I am was I can't steal. Because stealing opens up the gate. But stealing was my first drug of choice. Because that's when I got that first rush. I done got away with something, and it felt good. You know, we laughed all the way home after we got away from the lady in the Eckers, and, and we laughed all the way home about it. And I was excited about it. Couldn't wait to do it again. It was like the thrill of getting away with something. Um, and I started stealing at an early age. I mean, I was already doing little stuff at eight years old, but that wasn't... I didn't get the rush. I was doing that for approval and acceptance. But the rush started happening when I got away at Eckert's and, and I couldn't wait to do it again. And I knew something was wrong. With, I knew it wasn't right. I knew it was wrong, but it was the thrill of it being wrong and getting away with it. So uh, later on in life, in order to see myself coming, I had to learn what I could and could not do. I had to learn what makes me tick. I had to learn who I am from the inside. And today, you know, it's like to, to die on self be true. We had a Godfather's Pizza here in Gaston, and, and at that time it was the only one that stayed open late. Um, we were all getting high. This was early 90s. It might have been in 90, 1990, 89 or 90. But um, we were getting high. We were all drinking and drugging. And by that time, I was full-blown prostitute. Full-blown. Full-blown addict. Just doing whatever. Finding ways and means to get more. Doing whatever I could to, to, to get the next fix. I was already homeless and on the street. I was already homeless and on the street. And I spent two years of being homeless on the streets of Gaston. Like, all the way homeless. Nowhere to go. No address. N none of that. Um... Sitting around the table, getting high, bunch of us, bright idea. Somebody came up with the idea. I don't know who it was. It wasn't me, though, because I didn't have Robin in my, I didn't have that in my repertoire. I, I, I stole and I prostituted. Those was my two main things. And uh, But somebody said, let's go rob the Godfather's pizza. And none of us thought it through. It was like, first thing, come do it. We just, uh, yeah. And 
the person had the car, so we all jumped in the car. It was four of us, and we jumped in the car. I'd been up for days. I'd been up for three or four days. Hadn't eaten, hadn't slept, hadn't, hadn't slept. We got the Godfather's people. None of us thought about, you know, there were going to be people coming in and out. So we waiting for people to stop going in and out. We're going to go in when it almost closed. People going in and out, people going in and out. I went to sleep because I've I'm been sitting still. I'm coming down. Uh, I ain't had no sleep, so, I'm, you know, I went to sleep. Well, I went to sleep. They robbed the Godfather's pizza put everybody, six employees, in the freezer. I slept in the car. I woke up, sums up. Uh, I got in, went in the house where we were. They left me in the car, sleep. I was knocked out. I don't even know what happened, other than what they told me. Uh, go in, they laughing, joking, cutting up, talking, getting high. They gonna give me my money and my drugs. Uh, and I goes to wash my face, and I hear them talking about putting people in deep freezer. And I done been asleep, so I'm the only one sober. I'm the only one got some clarity. It ain't sound right to me. So, And this is when 911 first started. Trust me when I say first started, because none of us know about 911. We just know that if you call 911, the police came. That's all we knew, pretty much. But I didn't know that it could trace the number. I didn't know that. None of us, nobody knew that. But I called 911 and I said, y'all need to go get them people out of the deep freeze at Godfather's Pizza. Click. So I called the police on all of us. What in 20, 30 minutes, they was knocking the door down and taking us all. And everybody was facing 18 years. Well, the other three got 18 years. I got 30 days on, on every year for aiding in the bed. Uh, and I did my time. I went to prison for 18 months. So here's the thing that trips me up about the 18 months that I did in prison. I did I did the time, but it wasn't like, people like, like to make prison seem like it's, and it's bad, don't get me wrong. I ain't gonna dress it up, I ain't gonna fix it up, but female prisons are not like the men prisons. It's a lot of stuff that happens in there, but if you go in there, Okay, so four days after being in there, I jumped on the biggest person on the yard. I, I wasn't, I wasn't 100 pounds soaking wet then, but get it over with. Went and jumped on the biggest, baddest person in the yard. On the yard, she beat the brakes off of me. I would love to sit here and tell you that I won, but I did not. She beat the brakes off of me. Okay, put me in the infirmary for two weeks. All of this was messed up. Uh, eardrum was, was, was damaged and everything. She beat the brakes off of me. But when I went back on the block, she would tell everybody to leave me alone because I had heart, okay? And I came out tell, making sure she understood, I ain't scared of you. You, you might have whooped me, but, you know, I got a round two, you know, and that's what I would tell everybody on the yard. I got a round two. Anybody else want some? And I mean, you know, everybody saw how bad I was beat up, but I wasn't scared. And that's kind of what you got to do. You got to make sure nobody know. Everybody on in there got to know you got you ain't you don't have that fear. You go in there, you think that you let them know that you're scared. Then yeah, you'll get you'll get taken. I had this, and this is kind of what helped me start to turn around. Not like quite turn around, but had me thinking that I need to do something different. There was this. Um, we had this security guard. Well, we had like uh, one of the guards that was, she was on our floor at night. And she was a Christian lady. I can honestly say she was like one of the first people that had some decency about herself. She didn't treat us like a lot of the rest of them did. You know, she was, she was a sweet lady. Um, her name was Regina. And Miss Regina would if you had something about yourself, some self-respect or morals, and she knew that she could talk to you, she would. And she and I formed this relationship. She would say, I know you don't have nobody bringing you stuff in. I can't bring you no contraband in. But if you remember this scripture, 
I'll give you donuts or I'll bring you cookies, you know, and every once in a while she'd bring me socks, something like that, but not contraband, con no contraband. She's like, but okay, here's the scripture. When I come to work tomorrow night, if you can recite it by heart, you know, whatever she brought, you know, donuts, cookies, or whatever. And, uh, and she wasn't supposed to. But it was me and like maybe four other girls on the block. We made a competition out of it. And all day long, we would be practicing the scriptures on each other, making sure we could say it when she came, you know. Miss Regina going, so you know she going to test us. And, you know, this is like the only time you can get a donut, you'll get cookies or something like that. But she was manipulating us and teaching us the Bible. And we ain't know it. Um, she would start out with easy stuff. Give you one sentence. Or, or she would give you a verse and tell you to find it. And when, you come, when she come, you got to be able to show her what the scripture is and read it to her that kind of thing uh, and and that's when I started looking at there might be some good people in this world not everybody is from the dead world not everybody is from the black hole because back then that's what we called it it's, I don't know they call it the trap house and all of that now but we call it the black hole back then but not everybody was like that so um and that's kind of where where the switch started happening so when I got out of prison in 93 so I got out in 93. Um, I didn't know how to stop. I stopped for like two months, but I fell right back into the same set. They send you through the drug programs now, but back then they didn't have that. They didn't have that. Um, I didn't have life skills. And that's one of the key elements I teach at my, my shelter is life skills. So I came out and I went back to the same thing like two months later. I did not do any crimes because I was scared to go back to prison, but I couldn't stop. I was doing drugs and I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop. Um, I didn't know how. And there was this lady across the street from my mom's house and she was going to meetings and my mom was taking her and dropping her off sometime. And I don't know, I'd gotten homeless after I got out of prison. I was homeless again, and I was staying at my mom's house because you got to have somewhere to go to get out of prison. So I was staying at my mom's house, and I had, like, this curfew uh, that I knew wasn't going to work. I knew it wasn't going to work because it never had worked. But uh, pro, pro, my parole officer would come by randomly, and, you know, uh, back then they didn't have house arrest or anything like that, but they still did randoms. And so I was sitting on the porch on my mom's screen in porch one evening and the lady from across the street said, hey, you know, is your mom home? Ask your mom, can I give her a couple of dollars to take me to a meeting? And she never told me what kind of meeting it was. So mom was dropping her off at, the, at a 12 step meeting. And mom said, you need to just come on the ride with me. I don't want to go. She said, well, I'm not leaving you in my house and I'm not here. So I went. And on the way to the meeting, she convinced me to go in with her. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what to expect. Um, but it was my first 12-step meeting. I went for two weeks. Um, I kept hearing them say, you need to go to treatment. And I told my mom, I said, I might need to go to treatment because I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop. And so... Um, this lady helped me get into Black Mountain. And that's when my life changed. And I'm not one of those people who went to treatment a hundred times. I went to Black Mountain one time. I got out and I've been clean. I stayed clean for seven months, but I, my mistake was while I was in there, I told the counselor, I came up here to get off drugs. I didn't come up here to get off men. And I left with this guy. He's my, my daughter's father. He's deceased now, too. He died from pancreatic cancer when she was 16. But um, when I was four months pregnant, he put me out. 
and I wind it back up in Gastonia at my mom's house. The only reason why my mom let me come back was I was pregnant, her only grandchild. She, um, she didn't believe I was pregnant, but I was at the Salvation Army in Kannapolis when he put me out. And that was, that didn't go well either. Um, he tried to kill me and the baby by trying to make me drink Clorox. Uh, he wanted to kill the baby, but you know, if I'd drink Clorox, I probably would have died too, so it didn't go well. When he kept trying to make me drink Clorox, he gave it to me, I throwed it in his face and we fought. He didn't know me. He knew me from treatment. He didn't know me from the street. So all that I had been giving all them other men in the past, he got a little bit of it too. Yeah, uh, it did not end well. Um, his aunt, we were staying at his aunt's house. She called the police. Police came. Some little Bonnie fight looking police came. It was like he was throwing my stuff out the door. Every time he opened the door, I punch him in the face. Um, the police was picking up my stuff and putting it in the car, saying, I got to get you away from here, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to lock you up. You're pregnant, da, 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 da. And he took me to the um, Salvation Army. Um, Salvation Army found out I was pregnant, and they told me I couldn't stay, whatever. Uh, same police officer, um, I asked him. He, he gave me his card. And he told me, he said, if I need some help, to call him. He had empathy on me. Um, and so when the Salvation Army found out I was pregnant, I wasn't there, I wasn't there a week yet. Uh, I called this police officer and I said, my mom said I could come back to Gastonia, but I got to get a ride there. And, and he didn't believe me. My mom didn't believe me either. My mom didn't believe I was pregnant. Um, he didn't believe I had somewhere to go, but... So from the Salvation Army in Kannapolis, called my mom. My mom told him to make sure I was pregnant. So he lifted up my shirt. He's like, yeah, she looked like a pregnant toothpick. And he, all the way out of his jurisdiction, bought me the Gastonia. Could have lost his job, but he bought me the Gastonia. Um, and that was kind of where my journey started. Uh, I'd like to tell you I stayed clean, but I was six months pregnant, seven months clean. I relapsed overnight. Uh, and it only lasted overnight because by that time, I knew there was a way out. And because I knew it was a way out, it was like, it don't make any sense to go back and do what you've always done and you done been showed the way out. And so it was like May 19th of 1994. And that's why I wear the 94 on my neck. That's why. That's the year I took my life back. It was May 19th of 1994. I realized that there was another way and I didn't have to stay out there on the streets and I didn't have to keep doing the drugs. And all I needed was somebody to teach me how to get clean and how to stay clean. And so I did that, you know. Uh, and it wasn't easy. And I, and I tell the girls when they come in the shelter, this is not going to be easy. But it ain't going to be as hard as, it's not going to be harder than on the streets. I'm not going to talk to you nearly as bad as the dope man do. Nearly as bad. I'm going to talk to you with respect if you show me respect. Um, and that goes right back to being able to see yourself coming. If you know who you are, you got to learn how to change how you talk, how you walk, how you act. You got to change everything about you. Can't be any of those things. And it's all about change. You got to be willing to make the necessary changes if you want to grow and if you want to have something. It's not about putting down the drugs because at the end of the day, you don't have a drug problem no way. You got a meat problem. You got a meat problem. And drugs just heightens all of that. So if you put the drugs down and you deal with who you are and you look on the inside of what makes you tick, and who and what makes you who you are, drugs won't be the problem. Because, you know, for real, for real, if drugs was the answer, what was the question? Like, real talk. So if you, if you, and I teach the girls, it's like, you know, you know, we ain't, you know I'm not going to talk to you about the dope. Because the drug is a drug is a drug. It doesn't matter what you, what you used. Because at the end of the day, it's about who you are now. 
And I talked, I, you know, and I had to learn this, you know. All the stuff that I've done, that's stuff I've done. That's not who I am. And once I started doing the necessary, the right thing for the right reason, uh, even with 28 years clean, I'm still an addict. I just don't use. And I have to be real mindful of everything I do, everything I say, people, places, things, situations, and ideas. I got to be mindful of all of that because um, I know today the further I am from my last, the closer I am to my next. And I'm not above using. I'm not above relapsing uh, if I don't pay attention to who I am. Uh, side note, I just had major surgery July 15th. Major surgery. I had a breast reduction. I'm sitting here right now with still, I still got stitches. I went through that surgery with no medication. When I left that hospital, no medication, no pain meds, and I have not taken anything because I know me. I can't afford to let the demon get woke up because I know if I let that monster out of the box, I'll be running around gassed on you all over again with my head cut off, tricking, lying, cheating, stealing, cunning. And I'm too old to be jumping fences and running from the police. So I told my doctor, and I signed a waiver. I told my doctor, I don't want no medication. And everybody has told me, well, you're going to need something. You're going to need something. No, I won't. No, I won't. I know who I am. And I know I can't take nothing. I ain't got that twisted. And yes, it was painful. It was real painful. But I knew that. And I asked the doctor, is it going to be the kind of pain that I'm going to die from? He said, oh, no, you're not going to die. Okay, well, I'll be all right then. Because I'm more afraid of homelessness than I am pain. And my husband took care of me. He took two weeks, two weeks off work to take care of me because he knew and I explained to him, I can't take nothing. I can't afford to take nothing. I can't afford to wake up the monster. And it's been 28 years. And I don't have a monkey on my back now. He a full-blown civil back gorilla. He waiting on me to just slip up so he can just, and take me out. Uh, but I know me, so I can't take nothing. And... When I woke up from the surgery, I don't even remember the faces because I was groggy from the anesthesia, but I woke up saying, don't give me nothing, don't give me nothing. And my husband said, the lady thought I was talking out of my head. He said, no, she know what she talking about. She been adamant about that. Don't give me nothing, don't let them give me nothing. Don't let them give me nothing. Don't let them give me nothing. Because I know me. So when I left the hospital, I spent probably five days in the bed, just laying still. And it's probably the most painful thing I done had to go through. But I do know me. I knew if I could survive it, I'd be clean on the other side of it. And I've not taken anything. So that's, that's going back to seeing yourself coming. I got to see that coming. I got to know that if I let them convince me because what I've tell the girls you know the doctor will prescribe they're not going to follow you around and see what it do to you they're not they're not going to follow around and, and watch you become homeless behind a prescription medication they're not going to do that uh, and you can tell me I don't know my doctor gave it to you well let your doctor give you somewhere to stay in and so um, just you know that's just a sidebar of, of seeing yourself coming one of the other things that I've had to come to understand about who I am is um, I got the disease of addiction and I talk about that in, in its entirety because this thing will worm itself out of another hole so no gambling you know shopping is a big thing you know I, I gotta be careful when I go in the store because I got a uh, I want to buy one, sh buy the shoes, but I want to buy one in every color, because one is too many, a thousand never enough. And so I have to be mindful of that. And and these are the things that I teach in the life skills class. I teach the girls that you got a disease of addiction, so one is too many, a thousand never enough, and all that means is you'll never be satisfied. 
So you gotta be, you gotta learn how to be content. From after being out on the streets in 1993, um, really in 94, pretty much, um, at the end, and there's no such thing as bottom. People are like, oh, you gotta hit the bottom. You gotta hit the bottom. Well, bottom is when you stop digging, pretty much. That's bottom. Um, I stopped digging um, in '93. And that's when I went to treatment. Uh, I can remember Thanksgiving in 93, I was sitting across the street. I went to my mom's house for Thanksgiving. And back then they used to have Thanksgiving dinner and all the differences to how that's right. And my mama was hosting it that year. And I went, knocked on the door, and my mom came to the door and she handed me a plate and a glass of Kool-Aid out the door and I wasn't welcome. And I sit across the street, I sit across the street and all the cars in the yard, you could hear them laughing, giggling, talking, having fun. And I asked myself for the first time, could it be the dope? And that's when I started thinking about change. And I didn't know where to start. I didn't know where to start. And like I said, I got out when I went to prison. All, during all of that, I was headed toward prison anyway. But when I got out of prison, I didn't know how to stop. And when I did finally get some help, this lady named Jamie Black, she's the same lady that I said, I told you she died January. She died January the 2nd. My mama died the 7th. But this lady, Jamie, she came into my life. It was kind of a fluke, but it happened like it happened. She came into my life. And she taught me how to live and enjoy life as other people do. She taught me how to put down the drugs and pick up a life. She taught me how to um, get clean and stay clean. She taught me how to, she taught me about the disease of addiction. She talked about, she taught me about uh, learning how to be powerless over people, places, and things, situations, and ideas. And then, you know, the profound thing about that was, I was the person that went to place to do the things. And I had to learn how to stop me. I had to learn how to stop me. Uh, I had to quit blaming other people. I had to quit, um, I had to quit putting on that, that facade of, I can handle it. I had to surrender to, um, the drugs are bigger than I am. I can't, I've done a whole lot of things in my life, but I've never whooped the dope. I don't want a lot of fights but I never won with the drugs. And when I surrendered to the fact that I can't master that, I let it go. Now, how off the streets started was when I was out in the streets and I would, it'd be late at night and wouldn't be no, you know, no traffic and no tricks out there. They had no money, they had no dope. Uh, I used to say, if I could just get off these streets. That was my only dream for a real long time, if I could just get off these streets. And in 1999, um, I got my first place. I moved out of my mom's house. I got my first place. And I started housing people. I started feeding homeless people from the driveway first. And my best friend from, from the streets was still out there. So when I would get off work, I would fix a bag lunch and I would go look for her. But in between looking for her, I would run into everybody else. And so I winded up, you know, fixing five lunches, six lunches, 10 lunches, looking for her. And little bit nuts to me, she was hiding from me. Everybody was telling her that I was looking for her. She was hiding from me. But I was feeding all these people and I was having conversations with them. And uh, there was this lady named Barbara Wallace. And she was, sleeping and living behind the dumpster at the old Sears building. She had full-blown AIDS. And I was sitting down and I was talking to her. And I, told her, I said, well, why don't you come home with me and take a shower? Get you a shower and a hot meal. And I took her home with me and she took a shower and uh, she was smaller than me at the time, but I gave her a change of clothes. Um, my daughter gave her a jump rope to tie around the 
britches because they, you know, didn't fit. And uh, she took a shower. She got a hot meal. And when it was over, I realized she didn't have nowhere to go. And I invited her to stay on the couch. She said, you're going to trust me to stay on your couch. And I said, ain't nothing in my house that I can't replace. So if you steal it, I can replace it. Ain't nothing in my house. Your life is more important than anything that's in my house. And she started staying with me. She was the first person that I took off the street. And shortly after that, there were girls looking for her and word on the street because I'm still... Now, by this time, she is going to the health department. She's getting herself together. She's getting clean. I detoxed her off of heroin on my couch. Uh, got her connected with the health department so she could get on meds for her AIDS. Um, started taking care of her. Within a two months time, a two month period, I had eight girls living with me in a two bedroom house. And that was in 99 and that's officially when and they called the house Ahor, the International House of Recovery, because, but the girls called it Ahor. Mm -hmm. My house it was the International House of Recovery because if you came there and if you was going to stay there, you had to work on putting your life back together. And we were going to 12-step meetings then and dances and parties and cookouts and I was hosting spade night and bed we at night and clean fun and everybody that was you know leaving the 12-step meeting and coming to my house and we were cooking spaghetti and frying chicken wings and hanging out playing music and all of these things um, but it was a safe place to go and people started getting clean well, in 2002, now this was in 99. In 2002, uh, I met my husband. He and I started dating and we got married. Well, you can't, it's not a good idea to bring prostitutes to your house when you got a husband. So I needed a place for these girls to go because people are still out here. And so I started sending people away from Gastonia. I started doing relays because, you know, sent them to Atlanta, because I had girls who had left my house and got in programs down in Atlanta, got in programs in Durham, got in halfway houses here and here and here and here and here. So I started sending them places, and because I already done sent you, you know, six, seven months ago, I need you to go to the bus stop and get her. She coming to, you know, Durham and Winston-Salem and Chapel Hill and down in Atlanta and Georgia, Asheville, all of these places. So I'm connected. I got and I would do a relay. You know, I would call the facility and say, I got so-and-so, I'm getting ready to send her. And, you know, I was paying for everything out of pocket then. You know, i pay for a bus ticket, get her everything she need, and send her, you know, and have somebody pick her up and take her wherever she is. And they were doing good, but I started losing them because now I can't track them. Can't make sure, you know, but... So I was... Uh, placement program first uh, and then Hurricane Katrina hit couldn't find a bed nowhere couldn't find a bed nowhere and that's when I knew I needed to do something here and so um, that was like I gotta figure out how to I need a house because people are dying you know, um, it was right around the time they found Lacey. I don't know if you ever heard of her, but Lacey, they found Lacey in a dumpster. Somebody had choked her to death and threw her in a dumpster. And she was one of mine. But I didn't have nowhere for her to go, so I felt like had I had somewhere for her to go, you know, because they were still coming to my house and eating, but they couldn't stay there. Um, but I felt like I, if I had had somewhere for her to go, I could have saved her. 
and I told my husband, I was working at social services then, and I told my husband, I said, I gotta do something. I gotta do something um, because people are dying and I don't like it. I don't like it. And, and this was two months after I got married. You know, it's like, you know, I, I, I complained about my job all the time because I felt like, you know, this job is just paying the bills to do so I could do what I'm doing. But I, this, this job don't make me happy. Taking care of people, helping people get clean, that's what makes me happy. And so my husband's a minister, and he says to me, he come in the house, he's like, well, why don't you resign? So I did, put in my notice, I resigned. And uh, he said, after about two weeks of being home and nothing to do and driving him crazy because I ain't got nothing to do now, he came in the house one day and he says, um, so what's the name of that program you said? <laughs> you gonna start? And he was like, the Bible say you write the vision, you make it plain. You got to write the vision. And so um, I started working with this lady named Lisa Cito, who runs the Howland Family Resource Center at that time. She's not open anymore, but at that time she was around the corner. And I told her what I wanted to do. And she had had a lot of people come in that wanted to do things, but... I had a different tenacity about myself. She would tell me to do stuff, I'd go do it and come back. She'd tell me to go do stuff, I'd go do it and I'd come back. Well, you're gonna need this, you're gonna need that, I'd go get it and I'd come back. And one day, I had one of my girls with me who was detoxing with me. And I got a phone call, strange girl, crack house, bad situation. And I told me and my girl, I said, I said, we're gonna come back. I said, I'm gonna go get this girl though. She she ain't sound like she in a safe place, but I'm gonna go get her, I'll be back. And she's like, you don't even know who it is. I said, no, I don't. She said, well, how you know it's gonna be safe? I don't. I said, but me and her from the game, we going to get her, we be back. And I went and got her, come back. And the girl was, she was, she had been held in there for like three or four days, had been raped and beaten up. But we wouldn't got her. You don't even want to know the story about how we had to get her, but we did. You know, it wasn't like, come on, baby girl, come on. No, 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 no. We had to go in there and act real street. You know, they was cussing, we was cussing too. They was showing out, we was showing out too. And I threatened to call, you know, hey, I'll bring the police. You don't, you don't want that. That ain't what you want. You know, a uh, bunch of nonsense, whole bunch of drama. But Gala came back and uh, she's like, you gonna help this girl? I said, yeah. I said, I'm going to take her to the house with me, you know, and I'm going to get her cleaned up, and I'll figure out something after that. And like I said, I was married, so she couldn't stay. Um, but Lisa helped me do the nonprofit. I'd never heard of 501c3. I'd never heard of any of that. Uh, she helped me. She made me read Robert's Rules of Order. Oh, God, it's such a boring read. But she made me read it. Uh, she taught me how to do all of the things that I needed to do to put it together. Um, and Off the Streets was born. September the 30th, we're going we're gonna to do a, ga a gala and a silent auction at the conference center here in Gastonia on, um, from 5.30 to 9. We're going to um, celebrate 20 years of success. We've housed over 2,000 women. I think the count is 2016. Uh, with a 90% success rate, my girls make it because I teach them how to live. I teach them how to, I teach them the life skills, you know, parenting skills, money management, uh, the life skills necessary to be out here. I teach them, uh, I teach uh, um, life skills on Wednesday mornings, and what that consists of is learning how, learning about the disease of addiction and how to see yourself coming. It's all about uh, retrain, uh, re raise, retrain, and reprogram been operating for 20 years now uh, I am I am real real proud of the fact that my husband has been a sole supporter I've not ever gotten an income uh, he's taking care of me while I take care of the program um, that is I really believe that's the reason why I've been able to, and I I've not allowed people to force me into growing because I don't want to outgrow I don't want to outgrow the funding that I receive. Um, I house six at a time, uh, eight in the winter if I have to, uh, as, as an overflow. 120 days, I'm sorry, 120 days 
considered complete, but they can stay up to a year. And most of them transition out between 10 to nine to 10 months. They transition out, you know, but they come in, we go from zero to 100. When I mean zero to 100, clothes on your back when you come in, uh, to having a job and a spot when you leave. We go from zero to 100. They, they leave self-sufficient. And uh, I have some real good successes, um, a couple of millionaires. I have several people who have gone on to buy homes, gotten married, started businesses. Uh, yeah, my girls make it. I, I want to thank Gastonia. Um, for a real long time when I was out there, I didn't like my town. And I blamed the police for a lot of stuff. But it wasn't until I got my life together and I stopped being a problem for Gastonia when Gastonia stopped being a problem for me. Uh, but the whole time I was running around here acting a monkey and showing my donkey, I couldn't stand to be here. But now it's, it's like this is my home, you know. Uh, it's a great community. I, there's some wonderful people here. I have some real good collaborative collaborative partners that I, I, I do, you know, some churches that I come together and they help me with things that I need, um, some organizations that we get together and we um, double team some of the issues that's going on. Uh, yeah, Gastonia is a great place to stay. Uh, if you got a problem with Gastonia, you might want to look at how much of a problem you are for Gastonia. I'm just saying. Uh, it's peaceful here. It's one of the safest places I know, and I travel a lot. And Gastonia is like, you know, ain't no place like home. This is G-Town. This is G-Town. My daughter's in the Navy. She's in Bahrain now. This is her 10th year. Uh, she she grew up here. She um, she went to she went to Pleasant Ridge, then she went to Greer, and then she went to Forest View. And then from there, she went straight in the Navy. And whenever we talk, she talks about the cookout. They don't have them everywhere she go. They didn't have none in Hawaii. They didn't have any in Bahrain, but she misses the cookout here. And um, when she comes home, that's one of the first places she go to, and Tony's. Tony's ice cream. Uh, and so, you know, uh, some of the, the places, you know, the shrimp boat. You know, all of the, our favorite places here in Gaston, she miss all of those things. And so when she's home, she make her rounds. In order to support Off the Streets, we always collecting non-perishable items, um, hygiene products, uh, cleaning products. And for monetary donations, you can make a check out to Off the Streets program. And it can be mailed to P.O. Box 550547. Um, make it out to Off the Streets and in and, and the Gastonia, North Carolina, uh, zip code 28055. And we're always, we can't take clothes right now because of COVID. So monetary donations is basically where we are right now. But we are able to, we just started taking non-perishable items again. <laughs>